never really did anything. There wasn't a record company promoting it or anything like that at all. But that was a, a kind of similar get together. But this happened because I was talking with Max Recaro at Edel Records, uh, Ear Music, our Deep Purple's label, about some future uh, solo projects, various ideas. And I said at one stage, well, I'd love to do a, 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 Javelin's, a proper Javelin's record with a proper record label. And that was a year or so ago. And we met in London um, before Christmas. And he said, I've been thinking about that Javelin's thing. He said, let's do it. I said, are you serious? Really? He said, yes. He said, I think it'd be a great project. Right. Okay. So I got uh, the, I phoned the guys. I got the set list together of material. I called Steve Morris, my old um, songwriting and musical partner in Liverpool. He made the demos. I did the vocals for 16 tracks. We sent them to the guys to, re- to practice for six weeks. And then before we went to the studio in Hamburg. And we did all the, the backing tracks were all recorded in two days, pretty much. And I'm sitting in the studio and I'm going, oh my God, this is amazing. I was the only one that turned professional in this band. And these guys were not. Gordon joined another band for a little while um, that became the Sweet. Um, but mostly they had uh, other jobs and they became architects and uh, accountants and cab drivers and printers and that sort of thing. So their music basically stopped in 63, 64. And I guess one or two of them had interest in local band or, you know, they would play and practice band and that sort of thing. But essentially they hadn't played for 50 years. And so after this six week practice period, what I'm hearing now as I'm in the studio is amazing because this is not retro. This is the real thing. This is authentic. I'm hearing a rhythm guitar. I haven't heard a rhythm guitar since the 60s. You know, the rhythm guitar stopped. It was replaced by the keyboards in the rhythm sections. And I'm hearing a bass line going boom, 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 boom. I'm hearing drums. They're not going They're going <laughs> okay, this is amazing. I, even now I'm getting this. It's so exciting. A bunch of 70-year-old guys just acting like kids. It was fantastic. Sweet. Well, it was, it was actually quite difficult. In some of the songs were quite difficult because I had to learn a discipline that I had long abandoned because... For many years, I've had the freedom to do whatever I want to do, and I had to write my own songs to interplay with the musicians, to develop a different kind of uh, way of singing. Um, of course, the tone of the voice and the power and the uh, textures and dynamics are all very important. But this is someone else's stuff that I'm singing. This is Ray Charles. I'm, I'm, I'm going back to that, and I want to. I realise now I've got my own. The, I recognise the sound of my own voice. But the phrasing, I learnt all the phrasing from these, and they're all different, and the characteristics of the different singers, and the, you doing a Buddy Holly song, you use a gentler tone in your voice than when you're doing a Little Richard song, or a Ray Charles song is more jazzy, and you're doing a Bo Diddley song is more rhythm and blues, uh, Chuck Berry is more lyrical, you know, and some of these story, the story of uh, Memphis, Tennessee, that probably hardly anybody knows is the most beautiful song and you, you realize what an incredible lyricist Chuck Berry was. The story of a, a father being separated from his little daughter. Nobody writes songs like that anymore. They're just, because I think they would be considered to be uncool. Dreams nighttime too. We had, you know, stereo recording, uh, just starting. But of course, there's nothing digital. You can hear on all those recordings, and I hope you can hear on the javelins, the intake of breath at the beginning of a line. All that's got rid of these days, you don't hear it now because the engineers will cut it off. You just hear the voice as it starts. You can hear the squeak of a bass drum pedal. You can hear the room in, in that's being recorded in, whereas now in digital recording, there's a wall of sound, you know, that even the silence has a value. It was an education for the engineer as well, but you know, he's a very smart guy. And it's not difficult to understand uh, these simple things. 
The discipline is not to over-egg the cake, you know, not to over-ice it, not to make it over complicated, just to let the arrangements be normal. And uh, the joy of the music, the joy of the song, and the joy of the performance. There's no, in fact, it's so easy, there's no production, really. There's, all you've got to do is record accurately what, what's being delivered. There's, there's no great production deal, because that's, that's the antithesis of what was going on. Accurate recording was the ambition of every engineer in those days. I said to the guys, we'll split this five ways, and that's it. We'll pay the musical director, Steve Morris, and the rest we split five ways. And uh, no, we didn't. We couldn't write anything in those days. We were just too busy learning chords. <laughs> I re in fact, the writing started... Uh, sometime later, I was influenced by Roger Glover and when I was with Episode 6, a band called Episode 6. Uh, I was inspired by Roger's skill and talent and um, we ended up writing stuff together. But we did go through an early period. Like anything, you've got to learn the craft first, the craft of writing. You understand simple things, like uh, if you're writing words, don't, don't write an ooh sound on a high note because you need an E or an R on a high note in, in the word. So do dance or last or me or free or high or something like that, but don't do moo and you or anything like that, because ooh doesn't work with a high note. Ooh, no, don't think so. Not in normal register anyway. It's little things like that. But no, there's no self-written songs. There's no money in it publishing-wise for us. It's, um, that's not the point. You know. I don't know the mechanics of um, income. I don't know much about that sort of thing. I've got a wonderful guy called Phil Banfield who's been my manager since the 70s. And he has all my money. <laughs> and I trust him implicitly. I say, Phil, can I buy a car? He says, yeah, OK. As long as it's not too expensive. <laughs> when you say losing something forever, you know, I hate to make the analogy, but it's a bit like losing your virginity. So, yes. Life changes, it's never the same again. There's an innocence I was trying to describe earlier and a naivety and a joy, an unadulterated joy about being an amateur and a semi-professional musician. Your manager is somebody's uncle or somebody's friend. Your transport is your mate at work who's got a van. Your audience is all your friends from school or the people in your street or the people at the youth club. Your stage clothes are the same clothes as you walk around in. You go to parties afterwards, you're not special. You're just with all your old friends and you're a, a gang of people. Once you turn professional, there's a manager with a financial interest. And he's not altruistic. I can tell you that none of them are. They're in it for the money. And all of a sudden, you'll turn around and go, who are you? And she'll say, I'm your new girlfriend. I'm a model, do you like me? Where's the money, let's go to Hollywood. And all your friends are pushed to one side, inevitably. It's like life in general, you lose your virginity, you lose your innocence and you move on and you become, there's another thing, it's a complex joy of life and it's an interesting journey. Then you go through a crisis because in the years when you're so-called paying your dues, in other words, learning your craft, learning your business, learning your trade, learning to write, sing, perform, interact with other musicians. You can learn all of those things. But the one thing nobody can teach you and you can never learn is how to deal with success. You can see it with young sportsmen, footballers. You can see it with young musicians, young actors, young people of any success at all. Um, people who just get wealthy, you know, um, and behave badly because they feel they can do it. Um, because because if you have money, people are around saying, oh, you're okay, yeah, do this, let's go here, let's do that. And you're getting bad advice or no advice. And so you make a fool of yourself and you can destroy your entire future um, just by making some bad decisions because you can, because you're wealthy. And because people are not saying, no, 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 no more. Your school teacher would say, no, you can't do that. Your parents would say, no, no, no. Your mates in school and your friends say, no, 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 that's it. Don't be a... And pretty soon, Someone would tell you you're being an idiot. But when you've got money and you're young um, and you've become famous, no one's going to tell you that. And so you make a lot of mistakes. And that's all part of the professional journey. You know, if you can survive that, 
Um, and if you get past that, then you've got some good years ahead of you. And, but it's a different element to um, being an amateur turning pro. And I think it's very important to um, recognize and appreciate the amateur de- days. All of the guys in the Javelins, when we were in the studio, they did an interview afterwards, and every one of them said, we have no regrets, not turning professional. We've had fantastic lives they, you know, with their families and their jobs and their expectations were all fulfilled and they, they enjoyed the music and they enjoyed coming back but they looked at my life and thought I, I wouldn't have that, I wouldn't have that. There was, um, at the time there was too much uncertainty, um, they were giving up uh, um, the training um, and, and apprenticeships and all those things for who knows what. Well when I heard fire it gave me freedom because I had been, even with episode six, I was still learning, copying, and I was copying the Beach Boys. And then I heard fire, and I thought, oh my God, because I could do these high notes. And, I, and it was just, and then I thought, well, when I joined Deep Purple, I have freedom now. I, Arthur Brown gave me the key to escape. You know, I, He unlocked my world for me. And so uh, it was an ins- he was an inspiration, for sure. He broke all the rules. I mean, fire was a fantastic record. Absolutely brilliant. And I chose him as my hero. Arthur Brown was my rock hero. My rock god. 